Hello future doctors, this is Sam and welcome to another episode of the MCAT Master Interview Series where it is my job to extract the MCAT study strategies, habits, prep material and so on of top scorers on the MCAT. My guest today is Jennifer Niedemeyer. Jennifer, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. So Jennifer scored a 5.11 on the MCAT and the most impressive thing is that just a month before the exam date, she was scoring a 5.01. So she managed to increase her score by 10 points in less than 30 days. And we're gonna find out all about how she managed to make that happen. This is also her second time writing the MCAT and we're gonna talk more about that as well. So to begin, maybe we can get a little background information on just where you were before you began prepping for the MCAT. Sure, I'm, um, I'm actually a non-traditional student. I got my English degree in 2011, then worked at a doctor's office for five years before I decided to go back, um, back and pursue science and medicine. So wow. I had just finished um, my coursework, just the basic stuff. I mean, bio one, bio two, um, mm -hmm. biochemistry the stuff that's required. And um, I was doing that up in Gainesville, Florida. So before I started working on the MCAT, I moved down to Vero Beach um, and started studying here. It was yeah. kind of a change because up there I'd have been working in two research labs. So I came down here. It took me a little while to <laughs> catch the swing of things. But um, I did. I volunteered at a hospital here. And then when I started to get more serious about mm -hmm. uh, the MCAT, I kind of closed off and <laughs> spent like all day every day studying. So were you working while you were studying um, or did you have any other obligations throughout your MCAT prep? Yeah, I did. For most of the time I was volunteering um, just one day a week. I was shadowing mm -hmm. a physician and then I was also working part time at a restaurant as a waitress. Yeah. But I only did that for about two months of my um, MCAT studying when I realized that was just not going to happen. So I, I spent the next five months um, without MCAT mastery trying to study, and that wasn't very effective. But I was doing it at that time without anything else on my schedule. Yeah, that's interesting, actually, because we often get students reaching out to us wondering if they should be studying for the MCAT full time or if they can actually get a high MCAT score while maintaining a balance in their lives while having a job, having extracurricular activities. And what we say and what from what we've seen from top scorers is that both those scenarios are possible. It just, I think, depends on the person, what they prefer. It just depends on the circumstance. It depends on if the student is willing to make extra time if they're working full time, for example. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of variation, but it was also very interesting to hear your perspective on that. So thank you for that. I think they can definitely find a balance. Um... It just takes scheduling and especially if someone's involved in like a, an extracurricular activity that kind of complements their studying. Like my being at the hospital mm -hmm. was helpful because I was surrounded by medical per personnel and they were just, they were eager to answer my questions or they'd come and see like a notebook or a flashcard that I had and try it. So it was convenient in some regards. Yeah, that's a great point. Like if your work can help with your MCAT prep, then why not, right? All right. So... When you began studying for the MCAT, what was your score goal and how did you come up with that? My score goal was a 519 um, mm -hmm. and I had that score goal because I know that that's kind of the median incoming score for Duke University, Duke's medical school, mm -hmm. which I was really interested in at the time. Um, and then I just kind of, that number just stuck in my head. I figured it's best to aim really high and then hopefully I mean I don't know maybe I'll take it again if I don't get in this year and just see if I could do a 519 now that I understand how to study but yeah that makes sense and I'm actually not surprised that you aimed for a high score like that because from what we've seen is that top scorers in general tend to do that and I think there's um, a motivational factor to it but there's also some strategy in there where you know you're aiming for a 520 and you end up with a 515 fine i'd rather have that than aim for a 510 and accomplish my goal you know and i'm not saying use those numbers because it all depends on what school you want to go to and there are different factors about how your mcat score goal should be created strategically and we cover a lot of that 
But I think that's an important point to keep in mind for anyone listening. Just aim it high and use that as leverage for your MCAT prep. The other thing is to have a tangible score goal. A lot of students actually, when you ask them what their goal is as they're studying for the MCAT, it's just something like, oh, I want to get a high score. And I think top scorers make sure that they have a tangible score goal because it helps them when it comes to measuring their progress. You know, you can't really see when you're halfway to a high score. You don't, you can't see that. But you can understand that you're halfway or three quarters of the way to a 515, for example. So in terms of measuring, having a tangible score goal is very important. All right. So you've written the MCAT twice. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so tell us about the first time you took it. What happened and what did you realize? Well, the first time I took it, I really hadn't taken the time to troubleshoot. I mean, people say all the time, go over your practice tests and, you know, find out what you got wrong and why. And I was definitely doing that, but I wasn't. I think I was so hung up on the fact that I have I've always had good grades in classes, so I assumed that my study habits were working. Um, And I didn't even think to troubleshoot that. But what I ended up discovering were my two big issues were, I'm a a slow reader. Apparently, the student average um, words per minute is like 300 words. Well, that's the average reader. The average reader reads at 300 words per minute, so that's just your average person. But um, I was only reading at 180 words per minute, which is ironic because my degree is in English. So oh, I don't know why I'm such a slow reader. <laughs> but anyway, so like my first test, I just I approached the test assuming that it was OK that I didn't finish the test. I mean, obviously, I bubbled in anything I didn't, you know, yeah. get to. But I was I thought it was OK if I could only get through seven passages in cars and, you know, like eight in chemistry and physics and mm-hmm. nine in bio. So my first approach was just, I think, messy because I didn't realize I could go faster. So I just went in there and was like, well, I'm going to answer and do what I can and what I can't. I'll just skip. Or if there's a passage that's really difficult, I'll skip that one because I don't have a lot of time anyway. Yeah. Um, I have friends who, who still have issues with timing and, and some people struggle more with um lingering on questions rather than pushing themselves forward and actually MCAT Mastery offered some great advice for that I have the strategy guide and they kind of laid down some good rules as far as you know if you get to a question give yourself a certain amount of time and if you can't do it in that amount of time move on but my biggest issue really for the first test was I just couldn't get through the reading fast enough yeah timing is a huge challenge for a lot of pre-meds But what a lot of people don't know is that with a little bit of strategy and a little bit of investment in understanding yourself and what you're doing wrong or how you can enhance your test taking stamina, you can nearly eliminate the timing problem. And as a result, you can dramatically increase your MCAT score because Timing is usually one of the main reasons why students have scores that are staying stagnant or low. And those are the kind of strategies that we cover in the Top Scorer Strategy Guide. Exactly. Yeah, it was really helpful. Yeah, so did you have any other challenges or struggles or roadblocks? And if you did, and especially for the timing issue, how did you end up overcoming these, um, these frustrations? Well, I overcame the timing issue by um, downloading a speed reading app just to teach you how to, you know, read faster because I was doing something called sub vocalization, which is where you read the words in your head as you're as you're reading it. So it's almost like you're reading quietly, but at the pace that you would read if you were out loud. So I had an app that helped me kind of push through that. And I mean, you don't need to read a word in your head just to understand the word your eyes can just make that connection for you so that was really helpful um another roadblock i had was up until i found mcat mastery i was using only um princeton review study prep material Mm -hmm. um mcat mastery recommended next step um and also other just kind of diversifying and using other material and that was really helpful for the other section i was struggling in which was the um psychology and sociology section Mm -hmm. i discovered that um princeton review was not really very (laughs) accurate at all for that section so while i was 
scoring like 130s on my practice test when I actually took the AMC test, I, I tanked really badly. So uh, um, diversifying, finding different study material or just different practice tests was really, really helpful for that. Um, you can kind of, especially after you've written the MCAT once, you kind of can so do somebody else's practice test and you can gauge for yourself how accurate it is, how how similar it, fe it feels to the real test. So I did find next step was really, um, at least for the psych part, was really accurate for me. Nice. Okay. So aside from next step, were there any other materials or prep books that you used that you found were very helpful to you and that you'd highly recommend? So I, I did the self-paced um, MCAT prep course from Princeton Review. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't really recommend that. Um, I'm really good at self-paced, but for some reason that just really wasn't effective. I mean, even going through all the material and going through the books could just be me, but mm -hmm. I felt like I was really plugging in the time and it, it just didn't really work well for me, even though I've done really well being like an independent student. So, um, but I, I also felt like their tests weren't really that representative. The cars part, well, the cars part was pretty accurate, but the, like I already said, the psych wasn't very accurate. Um, yeah. I also used Kaplan, but I only used their textbooks um, and three of their practice tests. I just bought a little bundle. I thought Kaplan was um, really well organized and the books had a lot of information. And what's really helpful about Kaplan is they do, they give you a bunch of little mnemonics. Like as you're studying through the book, they'll come up with a little way for you to remember it, or they'll have a practical application note where you can kind of tie in what you're reading to real, the real world of medicine, which was helpful. Um, and their tests are pretty accurate. They're hard <laughs> than the AMC. Um, the key stuff to practice with, I think, is the AMC material, which obviously that just makes sense. Um, but I bought everything that I could buy from them. So all the different practice bundles, as many practice tests as they offered. Um, and I actually did their practice tests, like, like you guys recommend in um, Strategy Guide, I did their practice tests multiple times. Um, and that helped, too, because I, I feel like it was kind of weird. I would take a practice, an AAMC practice test for the first time, mm -hmm. and then I would take, um, well, I took all of the AAMC stuff early this year, like in March, April. So when I was approaching them a second time through MCAT Mastery's recommendation, um, they were familiar, but not super familiar. So I would go through those. And then I would take another test from a different company, one that I'd never seen before. And I would see like a, a significant increase in my score. And I don't know what it was about taking a, 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 a sorry, an AMC test a second time. I don't know why that would help me so much, but yeah. it's like when I would take a, I don't know, next step test after that, I had a better feel for what I was looking for. Um, so definitely AMC material was, was great. And then next step, uh, that's the only other stuff I use. So AMC, Next Step, Kaplan, and Princeton. Thanks. Yeah, it's not uncommon for us to hear top scorers mention how they retook AAMC practice exams during their MCAT prep, which is why we recommend it in the guide, it, along with all the other top scorer recommended MCAT strategies. There are a lot of reasons why it's actually a smart idea to rewrite the same AAMC practice exam, one of them being that it gets you even more familiar with how the actual MCAT will be, which in itself is incredibly useful. But again, you need to know how to reuse them. Like you don't want to be rewriting the same practice exam, not getting any benefit from them and wasting seven and a half hours or more of your study time. So we recommend getting the MCAT strategy guide and going through that beforehand if you plan on implementing the strategy. All right, so on that note, we have mentioned the strategy guide a few times, and I actually wanted to dive a little deeper into understanding how you, Jennifer, you use the strategies in the guide to help you and contribute to your great overall MCAT score. But actually, before you answer that, I did want to clarify for anyone who is new and hasn't heard of MCAT Mastery before, you know, what this guide really is, so there isn't any confusion as we're kind of discussing it right now. 
All right, so essentially over the past several years, we at MCAT Mastery have been constantly dissecting the MCAT study habits and MCAT study strategies of top MCAT scorers. And through our research, through many interviews like this one, we've discovered extremely effective and more importantly, extremely reliable methods to tackle this this beast of an exam. So everything we teach has been proven to achieve top MCAT scores and everything we teach has helped students increase their scores in great leaps in really short amounts of time. And that's again because everything is rooted in the credibility of top MCAT scores. And we've compiled all of that information into a downloadable PDF that we call the Top Scorer MCAT Strategy Guide that you've been hearing about. With that said, now Jennifer, it'd be great if you could give us your feedback on how those strategies helped you improve your score to a 511. I definitely think it's the main reason I increased my score. Um, I also signed up for the little emails that you guys send out and between the strategy guide and the emails, it was a lot of encouragement. And there are a lot of times, I mean, everyone who's taken the MCAT or is studying to, to take it knows it's just like, it's an emotional I mean, yeah. nightmare. It's, it's difficult studying, but it's also, you're just, especially if you take a test and you're like, I've studied so hard and I still am not getting better. So mm -hmm. what it was helpful, what was helpful in it for me was it was, it offered a lot of reassurance, kind of encouragement. And then there were a lot of tricks that they talked about where I'd be like, oh, I've heard of this before. I, I mean, somebody's mentioned this or, okay, that kind of makes sense. I thought of trying this, but I didn't. So hearing it mentioned again in the strategy guide was like, okay, I'm going to try it. It might work. It might not, but this is my last ditch effort. I'm going to do it. It really was. One of the things that I implemented um, that I had not before was using flashcards, like kind mm -hmm. of writing down, going through like questions I got wrong and making flashcards for those questions, not just to remind myself of the correct answer, but also to kind of test like, you know, it, you want to know why you got the answer correct or why you got the answer wrong, but you also want to know what the other answer choices are or how they're right. related or not. So that was really helpful is using the flashcards. It just, great. I mean, the whole strategy guide's loaded with really great tips. <laughs> okay, so just to clarify and get an overall picture here, after four and a half months of studying, you scored a 501 on your first MCAT exam. And then two and a half months later, you barely saw your score move. And then when there was just one month left before the MCAT, you managed to increase your score to a 511. That's almost by 10 points. Is that a good summary of your journey? Or is there anything I'm missing here? Yeah, that's exactly right. Because after I took the test in May, I kind of gave myself some time off and didn't really go back to studying right away until mm -hmm. I got my score and then I was frustrated and I went back to studying but I went back to studying the same way I had so it wasn't it really was only a month with MCAT mastery that I wow. that I increased because up until the, the the last score I got before I took um before I started with the MCAT mastery was a 502 so I mean it was like mm -hmm. a one point increase from my actual test um it just yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Wow. Okay. So what was the lowest score that you've ever gotten on a practice exam then? Um, it was a 497. Okay. So I'm assuming you did a diagnostic? Yeah. My diagnostic actually was a 500, which is why I was pretty upset with the outcome. Because I mean, to go from a 500 to a 501 on the real test. Wow. Uh, the 497 was kind of a, a weird like a random fluke test. I mean, I hope that's what it was. But yeah, that was the worst I ever got. <laughs> and it was my diagnostic. <laughs> yeah, from what we've seen, fluke tests are normal. They happen and they can be in any direction, really. So it's always good to be honest with yourself and see what the next test has to say. Um, also, I can imagine that, you know what, there must be a lot of people just like you who have paid a lot of money for a big name prep company and with high hopes and just haven't gotten the results to show for it. So I think it's completely understandable that you were upset. And I think it's just good that you didn't kind of stay with it, keep doing the same thing and you sought out different solutions. So 
I was not happy. <laughs> yeah. So what were the most effective strategies that you've used? And if you feel like you've already kind of mentioned this, that's fine too. Um, I don't think I have, but what was most effective for me was um, doing like that last month that I studied, I took a practice test one day and then the next day I reviewed it, like deeply reviewed it. I'm talking about like a 12 hour long day. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next day I would take another practice test. And then, I mean, I just, I took, I don't know how many, like 15 practice tests over the course of that month. And I thought that that was the most effective. It, it, I'd already reviewed all of the material, you know, I did, I didn't think studying the books anymore helped. So I just took a ton of practice tests and reviewed them. Nice. Yeah. There comes a point we've realized where you don't need to do any more review and the greatest advantage you'll find is in practicing and applying your knowledge through nonstop practice exams. Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, because I had already studied and reviewed the material, which I don't, I think I spent way too much time reviewing the material. I mean, I just took all these classes. I didn't need to do that. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely taking the practice tests was really helpful, especially the AMC, because you kind of start to see a trend. You, I mean, it, on the actual test that I just recently took, there were a couple questions where I was like, you know, this feels right. <laughs> I don't know this question. and I don't know <laughs> yeah. for sure the answer, but this feels right. And I'm just kind of going back to my many practice tests. I'm going to just say this is the answer. And obviously, I don't know if I got those right, but my score went up. <laughs> yeah, it's actually funny that you mentioned that we refer to this intuitive almost gut feel that a lot of top scorers mentioned like how you did we actually refer to it in the strategy guide as the mcat masters sixth sense <laughs> and it basically refers to that idea of top scorers just kind of seeing through question writer tricks and traps and just having a gut feel for what the right answer is even though the logic might not support them and we actually also talk about how to develop that. And like, yeah. it's funny that you mentioned it though, because every now and then we hear a top scorer talk about that as well. All right. So moving on, we kind of were also wondering how you managed a 130 in the psych section. And if somebody wanted to get a similar score or increase their psych score on the MCAT, what recommendations and tips would you have for them? I would definitely avoid Princeton Review for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I did. So um, they, I just, I mean, Kaplan is the way to go for that particular section. So even if you just bought one Kaplan book, um, the psych book, um, that was really helpful. And I would recommend doing that because I, psych is an easy part. I mean, everyone will tell you probably that's the easiest section of the whole thing test so I was shocked when I did so poorly on it but mm -hmm. it was just because I didn't have great um like a great frame of reference um what I did for that is I I bought the AMC psych packet and I started working through all of those passages and um then just kind of focused on not second guessing myself which I discovered was the main issue um I would get to a question and maybe they'd throw in one one answer choice that you're like I've never even heard of that in all of my studying I've never heard that word um, and then, you know, you just kind of have to not be alarmed by that kind of thing and, mm -hmm. you know, rule out all the other ones. If you can't, if you can't make a decision about something that you're not sure about, just, I, I don't know. I would say doing a lot of practice tests really helped me with that section. You start to be able to spot the traps. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that was helpful. So there are a lot of students right now who are listening to this and who are studying for the MCAT and they're feeling a lot of worry and frustration and anxiety as they think about the MCAT, they think about how daunting it is and how maybe their scores aren't increasing or whatever their reason is for just being in a very difficult emotional state right now. My question to you is, have you or did you experience something like that throughout your MCAT journey? And especially on the day of, you know, I'd be interested in hearing about that. How did you deal with any anxiety that you felt and how would you recommend that other people and other students deal with that anxiety and all those difficult um, emotions as they're prepping for this huge exam? Um, I made sure I, I got enough sleep. That's a big thing for me just in general. I can always tell yeah. when I haven't slept well if I'm feeling like kind of hopeless about the test. Um, so there were honestly days where I would get up, especially earlier on, I mean, like back in 
July, um, where I'd get up and I would just feel so frustrated and so overwhelmed, so I'd, I'd go take a nap. <laughs> also found out about the power of meditating, which I had never before thought I would ever want to do, because I, I like yoga and I like exercising, but meditating mm -hmm. just seemed... I don't know, it seemed like a waste of time, but then I started doing it um, only for the last two weeks of my prep. Um, mm -hmm. I would do it about 10 minutes every morning. Some mornings I would skip, but um, so for actually for my my uh, most recent MCAT test, I got up in the morning and I had stayed in a hotel room because I couldn't drive um, the distance to my test that right. morning, but I got up and I had a healthy breakfast and I meditated and I just, I kind of reminded myself that whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I'm as prepared as I possibly can be for this test and <laughs> whatever I don't know, I'll find out, you know? So, and I just, that's kind of how I dealt with it the whole way through. Um, I think it's really important throughout the whole process to, to stick with the things that keep you feeling grounded. So if that's working out, if that's hanging out with friends, like, um, have stuff that, you know, increases your emotional well-being because that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah, hundred percent. That was great. I think a lot of the things that you talked about are the aspects of life during MCAT prep that go unnoticed or not really unnoticed. They just don't get enough attention from students. You know, the people are always focused on studying and how much studying they can get because we've been taught that the amount of action that you put in studying is going to lead to the results and people don't really take time to take care of their internal self doing the things like you mentioned um, top scorers do and which is why this idea we've constantly kept pushing you know throughout whether it's through our emails and our guides and our products etc like we almost feel like we overemphasize it um, but taking care of your inner state whether that's through meditation meditation is like something that we recommend everybody give it a shot at least like just try it out like it has so many benefits scientifically proven that can lead you to really perform at your optimal abilities during MCAT prep and not only that but taking care of what you eat how you sleep and one of the things that you mentioned is the way you talk to yourself and talking to yourself in a smart way you know obviously i want to say kind way and talking to yourself like you're your best friend that's important but doing that is smart because when you are constantly criticizing yourself and you're put, bringing yourself down into a like a negative state that's not helping your mental clarity and your mental efficiency and you especially the day of the mcat or while you're studying while you're doing practice exams you don't want to be in a clouded or negative kind of state of mind you want to be amped up you want to be like a kid who's just ready to enjoy or like like somebody who's just ready to win a game you know they're not in a um detrimental mindset they're looking forward to it they're like i'm ready i've prepared and I can do this type of mindset. So a lot of great points there. And is there anything that you'd like to add? I would definitely say the MCAT test is like designed to make you think that you're stupid. I mean, every, yes. I'm sure everyone listening to this has experienced that where you've gotten a bad score or there's a concept that's not clicking and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm too stupid for this. And like the important thing that I found for that is to not let myself get into that line of thinking. It's not that I'm too stupid to take the test or to do well. It's that I need to figure out how how to take the test and, and how they want me to do it. I know the material, and I think a lot of MCAT test takers feel that way. They feel they know the material, so why aren't they getting good scores? And I think it's just important to make sure that you are encouraging yourself the whole way. So, yeah, I thought that was a great point that you guys <laughs> stress in your guide. <laughs> Thanks. So looking back at your MCAT prep, is there anything that you regret doing um, or that you regret not doing? And is there anything that you would do differently? Um, I did say that I regret um, spending so much time doing review. But along with that, I regret not taking a genetics course or a microbiology. Like I said in the beginning, I, I only did bio 1, bio 2, the, you know, two chemistries, two orgos, two physics, biochemistry. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much all I did. And I feel like um, for the biology section, some of the passages I knew, I understood, like especially the genetics one where everything is like some sort of abbreviated gene, like three letters and two numbers, and you're just like, what am I reading? Um, 
I understood those passages, but they slowed me down, definitely. So I would say to people, especially if you're, um, you're a student currently, mm-hmm. try and take classes that will help you um, with this kind of stuff. And as you're studying, be mindful the whole time of what you're going to be gearing yourself up for. I mean, if you're taking a genetics class now, kind of go in there and approach them and, and approach your coursework with the mentality that you need to know some of this stuff for the MCAT and just really apply yourself the whole way through. That would be one of my regrets is not taking more bio classes because I do feel like that kind of hurt my score a little bit. But otherwise, I, I just, I wish I'd come to all of this sooner. I wish, I mean, I'd, I think I told you um, before maybe that I, I had heard of MCAT Mastery's guide back in like, March and I just thought it was a hoax. <laughs> so yeah. I really wish I would have gotten over myself and and just done it then because I really think I would be closer to my five nineteen goal. So I, don't know, <laughs> I would say that's my regret. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. I guess lastly, I'd love to know what the future holds for you. What plans do you have now that you've gotten a pretty impressive MCAT score? Where do you see yourself headed? Well, the immediate future is hoping that I get accepted somewhere this year. Um, Mm -hmm. I've applied to quite a few schools, and um, I I haven't. I mean, it's too soon for my application to have received um, any you know interviews just yet. But I have a couple friends at a couple different schools, and you know they're really excited for me to potentially be joining them. My long-term goals, whether I get in this year or next year, um, I'd really like to, I'm interested in surgery, um, Mm -hmm. but I'm especially interested in neurology. And that doesn't mean I want to be a neurosurgeon, although that does appeal to me, but I think a lot of people feel that way in the beginning anyway. Um, I'd like to have some sort of like a comprehensive clinic um, dedicated to all the different care needs of, like for instance, neurology. I had a friend Mm -hmm. who had... um, some really bad concussions kind of back to back. And I just think there's a great need for comprehensive clinics that can, you know, they have a neuro, um, a neurosurgeon on board, a psychiatrist on board, a neuro, um, what is it? A neuro, oh my goodness, a neuro ophthalmologist. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, those things are so integrated. I mean, if you look at the hypothalamus and all of the interactions that it has with your whole body, it's just, I think we need to have some more clinics that are dedicated towards treatment of kind of the whole system. Um, so I'd be interested in kind of either joining forces with somebody who's doing that or starting that myself, or obviously those mm-hmm. are really long-term goals, but yeah, that's what my future looks like. I hope. Wow. Thanks for that. I love asking this question because you get to hear such beautiful visions like yours. And I feel like it's so inspiring to anybody who's on this journey to hear from you, not only be inspired by your uh, high MCAT score, but also by your vision. And it is my hope that someone who is listening to this, who doesn't necessarily have a clear cut vision of their own or, or a clear cut reason for being on this journey, that they use this opportunity to create their own vision, create their their own why because I think at times of struggle during this journey that are inevitable at times of failure and setbacks it is your vision that's going to keep you going and that's going to make you open up that book and keep you motivated to constantly study and strive to be better definitely so with that said this has been great once again Jennifer congratulations on your grade score and your impressive score increase I think a lot of students will find your journey incredibly inspiring and I can guarantee that you know by taking the time out to share your insights today you've truly made a difference in someone's life so on behalf of the entire MCAT mastery community thank you again and we wish you all the best in your journey to the white coat thank you very much and thank you for putting together MCAT mastery and running such an awesome and incredibly helpful kind of operation there (laughs) well hearing stories like yours makes it all worth it so thank you again Jennifer and good luck Thank you very much. Hey, this is Sam again. And before you go, if you like this interview, click the subscribe button so you can be notified when we release the next MCAT Master interview. Also, please do us a favor and share this with anyone who you think could benefit. We're really trying to help as many pre-meds as we can. And if you want to get daily top scorer MCAT strategies emailed to you, 
Sign up for our free email list by clicking the link in the description. When you sign up, we'll also send you real case studies of 510 plus scorers to keep you motivated, as well as some valuable free PDFs and other resources that will help you take your score to the next level. And lastly, I just want you to remember that even though this journey can have a lot of moments of doubts, frustration, and worry, you've come really far and you definitely have what it takes. The MCAT can be conquered and again, just like Jennifer emphasized, the MCAT was designed to make you feel inadequate. So it has nothing to do with you but your approach to how you're studying for the exam. Once you get your approach down, you'll see your score improve. And of course, you can get the top scorer MCAT strategy guide to show you exactly how to do that. The link to that is in the description as well. With that said, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next interview. Good luck with your MCAT prep. You got this.